Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of the final day of the Kick Conference. Um, so, in this uh, session, we are going to have uh, three invited talks. So, the first speaker is from uh, is uh, Dr. Adam Khan. He's an assistant professor in physics department at the whole University of Management Science. He's also chair of physics department at LUMS now. His current area of research focus on uh, quantum optics and communication. The uh, title of his talk is uh, Initial System uh, Environment Correlations in Open Quantum System. Uh, Dr. Adam Zaman, you can share the screen. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Um, can everybody hear me? I'm not so sure about my mic. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, great. Okay, uh, can you still hear me? Well, the mic, mic is a bit further away from me now, so I'm to be. Uh, uh, yeah, to... we can hear you. Okay, okay, good. If there is any problem, I will inform. Okay, thanks. Okay, so can we start? Sure. Yes. Okay. Will... Okay, sure. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Thank you everybody for 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 coming uh, to my talk. Um, my talk is as you can see on. Let me first make it full screen. Okay, so I, I'll try to go pretty slowly in the beginning. Okay, because I don't want to make it very technical. Okay, so I want all of you to at least take something away from this talk, if nothing else. Okay. Uh, so the title of the talk, as you can see, is initial system environment correlations in open quantum systems, and it, I'll try to slowly explain what all these terms mean. Okay, so at least you get a rough idea, if not mathematically speaking, of what exactly have I been trying to do for uh, for a long time now. Okay, but in particular for the last one one and a half year. Okay, right. So the summary of the talk. Let me just present the summary straight away. So that everybody at least if if you if you go to sleep for the uh, on the next slide at least you understand this much okay so um you have this idea of open quantum systems what open quantum systems are is that if you consider any quantum system which has to be treated via the laws of quantum mechanics if you include in the description of that system it's inevitable interaction with the environment then that is called an open quantum system so any quantum system which is interacting with the environment is called an open quantum system okay and the key point that I would like to emphasize in my talk today is that due to these system environment interactions, the system and its environment generally become correlated. In particular, and that will be my emphasis in this talk, they are correlated before you even prepare some desired initial system state. You, know, you see, so no matter what kind of quantum protocol you have, you usually initialize your system to some desired initial state. And then something happens, okay, you carry out a series of unitary operations, you, you perform some measurements, but you always have to initialize your system, okay? Um, but because of these system environment correlations, these system environment correlations can, can actually play a role even after you have initialized your system state, okay? So that's what this initial, the word initial over here is what that means, okay? And like I said, the effect of these correlations can then show up in the in the in the in the ensuing dynamics of your system okay so that's essentially what the talk is about that your your system is correlated with the environment you prepare your system state because of these correlations the 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 environment then plays a different role on the system compared to what would have happened if it if there were no initial system environment correlations okay that's essentially it okay so if you want you can go to sleep now okay uh, but preferably don't go to sleep, okay? So I'll go into in more detail regarding these points, okay? So essentially, here's your basic problem in your open quantum systems, okay? So you have a quantum system which is interacting with the environment. That's it, okay? It's, that, that's basically it, okay? Of course, the actual system can be, you know, can be as complicated as you wish. It can be a very complicated spin chain. It can be a sing, sing, single qubit, okay? It can be a bunch of harmonic oscillators. It can be a single harmonic oscillator, okay? Uh, because of this interaction, we can say two things physically straight away. There will probably be some energy exchange with the environment. So the system can lose energy to the environment. It can gain energy to the environment. Of course, all these energy interplays are, of course, exactly what is the subject of so-called the field of quantum thermodynamics. Okay. You can also have something called decoherence, which is a loss of coherence. Or as like people like to say it, the that the off diagonal elements of the density matrix become zero. Okay, essentially what that means is that in practice that that means that it's difficult to observe interference 
okay, because of decoherence. Okay, let me just explain very briefly this very at a very basic level this idea is loss of coherence. Okay, so imagine you have a single qubit, that's your simple Hamiltonian. You have two states for the qubit, you have cat zero and cat one, which are defined as eigenstates of the sigma z operator. So the qubit has two energy states, one has energy state, uh, one has energy level h bar omega naught over two, the other one minus h bar omega naught over two. Okay. And what you do is that you initialize your system with this qubit in, in one of the states, cat zero, over here I've done. You apply a so-called Hadamard gate or a pi by two pulse. They are the same thing depending on, you know, uh, which language you prefer. So the zero state becomes zero plus one, okay? And then, so this is done very, very quickly. So this Hamiltonian essentially has no time to act. And then essentially once you have this state, then this Hamiltonian acts on this state essentially, okay? The unitary operator technically speaking corresponding to this Hamiltonian acts on this state. And there's a phase difference that develops. This phase difference, if omega naught is a constant, is simply omega naught times t, where t is the time elapsed, okay? And then what you do, you, what you can do is that you can say, okay, I want to read out this phase. Oh, the one thing you might think is, okay, I'll do a measurement in the sigma z basis. But if you, you see, if you do a measurement in sigma z basis with probability half, you get state zero, with probability half, you get state one. There is no information about the, this phase phi. What you should do instead is to do another unitary operation, another Hadamard gate on this state, and then you get this state. And now you do a measurement in the sigma z basis, and then the corresponding properties that you can either easily work them out is just that. So if phi is omega naught t, if you plot these properties versus time, you see a sinusoidal curve. Nice, like fringe, like fringes. Okay, so this is essentially Ramsey interferometry at a very, very basic level. Okay, so this is interference in time, so to speak. Okay, but now notice that if this omega naught is not constant, it's widely fluctuating. If this omega naught factor is widely fluctuating, so physically, for example, your qubit could be a magnetic spin and surrounding this magnetic spin, the other magnetic spins, which are producing some kind of randomly fluctuating magnetic field. So this omega naught keeps on fluctuating because the magnetic field is fluctuating. So if this omega naught keeps on fluctuating, then this phase difference phi keeps on fluctuating. If this phase difference phi keeps on fluctuating, this whole thing, this cosine phi is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, sometimes positive. On a very rapidly time scale, this becomes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So we actually do many experimental runs, you average it out, okay, you just get that P naught is simply half and P1 is equal to half. The effect of this phi is washed away. Okay, so that in a very, so in, in a sense, you know, the key point is that noise leads to loss of coherence. Noise leads to a loss of your ability to see interference, quantum superposition, okay? So noise is bad in that sense, okay? So why do we bother with that? That's precisely why we bother it with, with that, okay? Because the realistic quantum system interacts with the environment. So if you want to pro want to use any quantum technology that actually utilizes these quantum superpositions, okay? You need to take into account this noise, which will inevitably occur. You need to think up of ways, and people have done numerous, have, have, have done numerous studies on this thing, that how do you counter this noise, okay? Um, most of the studies, of course, have been done that, okay, that how do you counter this noise? Sometimes this noise can play an important role, okay? It can play a constructive role as well. Uh, it's, this noise is also important when you, when you talk about the quantum to classical transition. So, for example, if you consider that, okay, quantum mechanically a particle can be at two places at the same time. But in, in the in classical world, why, why don't you observe that? Well, that's just because, you know, the superposition state is destroyed, okay? Because of, of the interaction with the environment. Okay. Now, uh, when it comes to, to actually studying open quantum systems more quantitatively, well, you have to model your system. Usually the model that you, the system most usually considered due to quantum computation information applications mostly is a single qubit or a collection of two level systems. Okay, a single qubit or a collection of qubits or two level systems. Okay. Uh, here's one physical, physical example of a, of a two-level system. Uh, you, have a, you have a particle in a double well potential. The particle can be here, it can be here. So there are two energy states. All other energy, energy states are at much higher energy levels compared to these levels. So effectively, the particle can be found in this energy or this energy. It can tunnel across the barrier. So uh, it's effectively a two-level system. Okay? Of course, you can have many other physical examples, physical realizations of two-level system. Okay. As the environment, I'll be mostly considering physically speaking, although more, many of my results will be totally general, okay? I, but to be more concrete, because in order to produce some numbers at the end of the day, I have to assume some form of the system and the environment. 
the environment that is most commonly considered in 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 practice is a collection of harmonic oscillators the most common reason i can give you is that it can be shown that if you have a system which is interacting weakly with the environment the no matter what the actual form of the environment is you can effectively model the environment as a collection of harmonic oscillators okay uh this if you have your system is a two level system your environment is a collection of harmonic oscillators and what you have is a so called spin boson model that's one of the paradigmatic models in open quantum systems okay now our objective central objective is to find figure out the dynamics of the system well, for closed systems we all know to do or know how to do that that's just a shooting the equation but even for closed systems as you may know it it can become very complicated very quickly because as you know that the hamiltonian the dimension of hamiltonian goes up exponentially and beyond that if you have any time dependent fields okay so if your hamiltonian is time dependent then finding out the unitary time evolution operator is a pain okay because the hamiltonian at different times does not commute so it's it's a huge problem okay even for a single qubit if you apply some arbitrary time dependent field you cannot find the unitary time evolution operator generally in analytical form you have to do it numerically even for a single qubit no interaction with the environment okay so even for closed systems solving the dynamics is usually not that straightforward here i am following of course a much more complicated problem which you have a very large environment interacting with the system okay so how do we like figure out the dynamics of the system i'm not really interested in the environment beyond the fact that it has some interaction with the system so it's affecting the system in some way the idea is that you consider the system and environment together as one big system call it super system if you will and then that is a closed system this big whole thing is a closed system so i can do the time evolution using the usual methods that i have at my disposal but at the end of the day i'm really only interested in the dynamics of the system so what i do is that i get rid of the environment mathematically technically speaking what i do is that i trace out the environment i take a partial trace over the environment so to speak and what i end up with is a dynamical differential equation in time for the density matrix of the system never mind if you know these terms essentially what you find out is a differential equation similar to the schrodinger equation that allows you to find out the state of the system at any time given the initial state of the system okay that is the master equation Okay, it's known as a mass equation for historical reasons, not because it's it's the one equation to rule them all. Okay, okay, so so you have this is your this is the general form of your master equation. So you have the density matrix. So by the way, just to highlight this thing, is just your usual Schrodinger equation for a closed system. You have a correction to that. So this R, if you so if you allow me to speak of that, is is just a super operator. It's a it's a super operator. Something that takes in an operator and pops out another operator. Okay, so this uh, so there's a correction term, and essentially, you know, in these microscopic derivations of mass equation, the whole game is to come up with what exactly this is. Okay, and to derive this form of the this differential equation in order so that you can actually solve it efficiently on a computer, for example, numerically. you have to usually have to make various approximations so for example you you first of all as usual the usually the case you allow yourself to use perturbation theory so you assume that the system is weakly interacting with the environment okay that's called the born approximation then you allow say that the system environment correlation is time is short that that essentially means that the environment quickly forgets about uh, has very short memory it quickly forgets about things okay uh so technically that just means that the environment correlation function that will pop up in this term over here uh you can do some approximation on it okay and most importantly for this talk you actually ignore the effect of any initial correlations so you assume that the system and the environment are initially not talking to each other okay the environment is initially in the thermal equilibrium state let me just go into more detail about this assumption slightly more detail because that's the central thing in this talk the central result in statistical mechanics is the following okay that the thermal equilibrium state of a system in thermal equilibrium is this okay that's this if you are confused by this this is essentially just the boltzmann distribution okay so you essentially have a system with a given hamiltonian hs and the the equilibrium density matrix is just given by the exponential of that this zc is just the partition function is the normalization essentially of this exponential okay if you remember how this was derived this is derived by maximizing the entropy subject to the constraint that the average energy of the system is 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 fixed it's given okay it's subject to that constraint 
Okay, but if the system, so as implicitly you're assuming that the system comes to equilibrium by interacting very weakly with the environment, such that its average energy due to this interaction with the environment does not change. Okay, because if your system is interacting strongly with the environment, then you cannot talk about a fixed average energy for the system alone, then the system environment together form a big system. Okay, so essentially, so this is actually not the thermal equilibrium state if the system is interacting strongly with the environment. In actual fact, what you have to do is that you, again, you have to go, if you go back, you again have to consider the system environment together as one big system. Consider the thermal equilibrium state for this combined big system. If you're looking at the thermal equilibrium state only of the system, then, then take the trace over the environment. That's essentially what I've done over here. So the, the th system thermal equilibrium state is proportional to this H is a total Hamiltonian system plus environment plus the interaction between them. And you take the trace over the environment. Okay, so in actual fact, what you're looking at is that you actually start off from the combined joint thermal equilibrium state. You apply some operator on the joint thermal equilibrium state to prepare the system state. So omega is just an operator that actually only in the system Hilbert space. Z is just a normalization factor to ensure that the trace of the whole thing is one. And then you can actually show mathematically that if the system environment detection is weak, then you just get this. The system and the environment are essentially initially not talking to each other. They're independent of each other. Psi is just the initial system state. It, this is just the thermal equilibrium state for the environment. This is actually the initial state that people most commonly use when they are using a master equation. Because you see, even when you're using the master equation, you have to feed in some initial system environment state. Okay? The environment state plays in a role because in this, to calculate different terms in this state, you have to know the initial environment state. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, I will essentially present two problems that I dealt with. The first problem is the following. To actually simulate this master equation over here, you need to know different properties of the environment because you need to calculate some numbers related to the environment. In particular, you need to know something called the spectral density function of the environment. That's a function that characterizes the environment. That is a function that pops up in this term of the master equation. So for example, you also need to know the temperature of the environment, okay? And these are generally not known. So if you want to predict beforehand the, the, the quantum system, you need to know the spectral density function of the environment. You need to know properties of the environment. How do you figure those out? One very popular idea in the literature is the following, that you essentially use a very simple quantum system. You allow it to interact with the environment. If you allow it to interact with the environment, you can use the dynamics of the system to actually figure out what the environment is, what are the properties of the environment. Okay, so essentially this is a parameter estimation problem. You're using the dynamics of your probe, you're using this quantum system now as a probe, as a thermometer, so to speak, to figure out properties of the environment. Okay, uh, you can see the technical details over here, I'll just briefly go through it, okay. So essentially that's what I'm doing, and essentially the, usually the initial state considered is that, okay, that you have the probe, and that is weak, very weakly interacting with the environment, so you can take the initial state like that, just like I explained. But this is not realistic if the probe, if the environment is such that it's automatically going to interact very strongly with the probe. Not all environments in, in reality are going to interact weakly with your systems, quantum systems. We may assume theoretically, of course, for our ease, because you know, then we can apply perturbation theory, but in reality, experimentally, it's much more messy. How do, what do we do then? Uh, we actually found that found out our way. We actually said that essentially you can actually as, consider the correlations between the probe and the environment, and you can actually use them to our benefit. The, the idea is this. When you're using the probe with the, the interaction with the probe with the environment to figure out properties of the environment, you prepare the system, say you allow it to evolve, and you figure you, you figure out the properties of the environment from this evolution. Now, if you also include information about the environment probe correlations that existed before the probe state preparation, these correlations can actually give you additional information regarding the environment. So actually you can improve your estimation of, of, of your environment parameters if you actually include in your analysis these, these, these initial correlations because there's an extra piece of information that you have. You don't need to dump it, you, you can actually use it. Okay, so here's just a technical detail. So we took our initial probe state at single qubit that's a general state of a single qubit. These are just a block angles, theta naught and phi naught. If you assume pure defacing, we assume pure defacing because then you can actually exactly solve this problem. 
and purely physics is a pretty good approximation in many cases, especially if you just looking at the purely quantum properties of, of, of essentially decoherence. Okay, so you have essentially that the off diagonals there if in pure diffusing only the off diagonals change, so that's why you have the time dependent factors only stuck in over here. And essentially, the idea is that if your gamma is very big, this is your decoherence factor. If the if the probe decoheres very quickly, then you essentially pick up very little information about the environment because your probe state is quickly, very quickly, quantum mechanically destroyed before it really has any time to pick up any information about the environment. On the other hand, if it picks up in information of the environment very slowly, that's no good either. So there's a sweet spot that you have to look for, okay, in between. Uh, okay. So to quantify essentially how much information you pick up about any environment parameter x, it could be any parameter, it could be the, the, the frequency of the environment, highest, highest relevant frequency of the environment, called the cutoff frequency, the coupling strength with the environment, it could be the temperature of the environment, whatever, okay, that is just called x. That is can be quantified by something called the quantum feature information. Okay, the higher the quantum feature information, the more precisely you estimate than the environment parameter. Again, I'm not going to do technical details. Where does this come from? Okay, and then you can actually compute this thing for our case where you actually include the environment, the probe environment correlations into account. You take them into account. What you find is a beautifully simple result. If you did not include the correlations into account, you only have this term. That's it. If you add the correlations into, into that existed before the system, the probe state per person, you get an additional term. Notice that this is always positive. So you automatically pick, it, pick up more information as we, expect, as we expected if you take the probe environment correlations into account. And then we actually applied it, applied it to a concrete physical model. So you have a qubit. Well, you might be saying where is h bar? h bar is equal to one. Okay, I'm a theorist, so I'm allowed to do that always. Okay, so h bar is equal to one. You don't see h bar. Okay, over here, and you have your system. You have collection of harmonic oscillators. You have the interaction between your qubit and the harmonic oscillators. This is your spectral density. I am assuming it for, for for some form. So you might be, for example, estimating this this coupling strength capital G. You might be estimating this cutoff frequency omega c. You can actually solve the, the system dynamics with this system environment Hamiltonian exactly. This is the famous POD phasing uh, model, okay, for a harmonic oscillator environment. Essentially, you can solve it exactly because the because of this thing that the commutator for harmonic oscillator operators you you get a number. So higher order the series essentially eventually will truncate. Okay, uh, never mind if you didn't get that. Okay, but the point is that you can solve this exactly, and you can actually solve it with this initial state and with this state, where you actually include the initial probe environment correlations. And what we find when you actually plot the quantum feature information versus the cutoff frequency, you find that you can estimate the cutoff frequency much better if you include the probe environment correlation. So the black curve is with the environment correlations and this is without. So you can improve, you can improve it a lot, almost one order of magnitude. Okay. You can go further actually, because you can also solve this model by actually applying suitable control pulses. You can control this decoherence rate, this gamma factor, this omega factor, you can actually tailor it to your advantage by applying some appropriate control pulses. That, that takes us into, into the realm of dynamical decoupling. So I'm not going there, okay? But this, just the point I want to highlight is that you can actually control this by applying some suitable control pulses to your probe, okay? And if you optimize it over the pulse sequences, you can actually get something like this. This black curve is with correlations and the optimized control pulses that you use. And this magenta dots is with you being lazy and doing nothing. You're not including any correlations into account. You're not applying any pulses. And this is orders of magnitude higher. So you can estimate the environment you know, much, much, in a much, much, much better way if you apply optimized control pulses and take into account the probe environment correlation. Of course, there are then lots of other details I'm skipping over. You can you have to figure out what are the optimal measurements to perform, how you, you can you can estimate the temperature as well, you can estimate the coupling strength as well, blah, blah. It's all there in the paper, okay, you can read that, but that's essentially the gist of it, okay. We also did another work, which was related to essentially investigating the effect of the initial correlations on the so-called geometric phase. I'm not, I'm just skipping this over. This is just an advertisement for that work. If you're interested, you can go there, okay? 
this becomes very technical very quickly so i'm skipping over this okay for the sake of uh, otherwise i'll just confuse everybody okay but you can read it over there it's quite similar essentially again just i would like to highlight that this black curve is a correction to the geometric phase if you include the initial qubit environment correlations and this blue curve is without the co initial correlation so if you actually in the strong coupling regime if you actually include the, if you actually do consider the correlations you actually find out that the that the geometry phase is much more robust okay so this is for two different kinds of environments so for some environments is true for other environments the benefit is not that big okay to be honest okay right the next problem i would like to highlight just very quickly in five minutes okay because it's very mathematical i can just skip over all the mathematical details so i can easily do it in five minutes okay <laughs> it's essentially that okay you can you can think about okay i want to derive a master equation microscopic master equation by taking into account the initial system environment correlation so i start off by writing the total hamiltonian hamiltonian system plus the environment plus the interaction between them this is a system operator this is an environment operator okay you can generalize it to, uh, to some other form as well it's fine you can derive a master equation for that so the idea is that now your total system environment state is of this form it's not simply system multiplied by environment it's actually you know there's some correlations built in because this h is the total hamiltonian this omega is a operator the leave that x in your system hilbert space you can actually expand this state to second order in the system environment coupling strength via this identity homework you can try proving this beta is an arbitrary parameter x and y are arbitrary operators okay you can actually prove it the proof is very nice okay i'll just give you a hint you bring this to the other side so you get e raised to the minus beta x e raised to the beta x plus y is just equal to that and then you can take the derivative on both sides with respect to beta and you can show that the derivative of left hand side is always equal to the derivative of the, of the right hand side and you can show that both of left hand side at beta is equal to 0 is identity right hand side at beta is equal to 0 is also identity so you have two functions of operators they satisfy the same first order differential equation they satisfy the same boundary condition so they must be the same function okay <laughs> okay so anyway so you apply that identity essentially you can do all of time dependent perturbation theory using this as well by the way another homework exercise never mind okay so you can actually expand then the unitary time evolution operator where beta of course is then just minus it essentially uh using this identity as well you combine the two and then you can blah blah it takes a few pages you will eventually end up with this master equation never mind the technical details just notice that this is just your usual schrodinger equation this term is your usual term that takes into account the effect of the environment on the system the usual term okay so that that takes into account the good decoherence and any, any relaxation this additional term also takes into account of course the effect of the environment but this is essentially the effect of the initial correlations the fact that if we did not consider the state this initial state just to be system times environment it's actually this state okay and this j is an additional factor that, that you have to calculate is a function of beta blah blah there is a prescription for calculus but the point is you can calculate every single time over here and then you can do some numerical simulations we applied it to this model which actually generalize the simple spin boson model to many spins many qubits interacting with the collection of harmonic oscillators you can do it for that and you can see that this if you plot for example some observable jx versus time so jx is essentially the normalized expectation value of capital jx these are just angular momentum operators uh you find that this black curve is with initial correlations this dotted red curve is without initial correlations okay so there is there is a difference there is a there is a there is a quantifiable be clearly visible difference because of the initial correlation so even in v in the weak coupling regime okay to second order in the system environment coupling strength the initial correlations do play a role okay so i must emphasize that this term is to second order in the system environment coupling strength this term is also to second order in the system environment coupling strength you can see the whole derivation in this paper okay so i'm not going to do that and essentially just to conclude then uh the system environment correlations before the system state preparation cannot be ignored in general as has been usually done until now but now because people are coming up with systems with the system environment coupling strength is strong anyway so they really have to include those correlations that's why there is a lot of interest in this non markovianity and initial system core system environment correlations and so on so for example for superconducting qubits you can have the qubit environment detection for example is not very weak okay many times okay so you can we also looked at the constructive use of the initial system environment, environment correlations for example you can estimate the environment parameters better by using these correlations i also talked about the master equation that takes into account the correlations 
and that's it i would like to associate i would like to thank uh, hc grant and the lums lums grant also is so called salary grant okay that they pay my salary and you also have essentially scientific sports of students i haven't listed all of them just the ones that are most directly relevant to to the works that i present the three works that i present okay so okay. oh, that's it okay thank you thank you so much dr adam zaman there are two questions in the chat box so first one okay. is how realistic are those initial correlation for solving the problem how realistic are these initial correlations for solving the problem uh, well i haven't really assumed any form of particular form of the initial correlation you see i'm just starting off from from a, from the thermal equilibrium state the the actual thermal equilibrium state that you'll get of course will depend on what your system hamiltonian is and what your environment is and what the system environment interaction is okay mm-hmm. because yes in the in the very weak coupling regime then you can say that my system equilibrium state is simply you know this simply only depends on the system hamiltonian is simply e raised to minus beta hs the boltzmann state essentially but in if your coupling is not weak then uh, I mean, the, this result is totally general so if you if you notice over here I, i assumed nothing about okay that what exactly the form of the sky is what the form of this gamma is and similarly mm-hmm. I, i never really assumed any particular form over here i never really assumed a particular system environment model over here i just applied it to this just to illustrate the results okay okay uh there is another question are these result only for the deep phasing noise or in general any kind of noise and do you think by the noise oh okay so this one the quantum fisher information this one is only for the deep phasing noise okay this one is only for the deep phasing noise the second master question one is for any noise right uh so we are running out of time so uh, next uh, thank you so much for at okay no, no problem thank you work. uh our next speaker is uh, dr shahid ikmal so he is an associate professor in university of science and technology nas pakistan he has also served as a head of the physics department there he is working in quantum optics and information over 10 years now so his uh, talk is about uh, uh, photonic quantum metrology and overview okay. dr shahid ikbal you can share us uh, thank you very much dr bilal for a uh, nice introduction okay so let me share the screen okay Okay, we can see your screen now. Okay, thank you. So let me put it. So uh, thank you uh, once again, and thanks to the organizers for. um uh, inviting me be to this very uh, own conference we planned together while i was there uh, as a head of department so the topic of my uh, presentation is photonic quantum metrology so i will give you uh, an overview of the uh, topic so the layout of the presentation is first i will introduce the the general uh, notion of quantum metrology and then the estimation process in world and uh, uh, estimation theory uh, regarding and various bounds on, uh, involved in this estimation process and then i will focus on the particular uh, photonic strategies to implement this uh, quantum metrology and then i will present some uh, phase sensitive photonic states that be, will be used in this process so actually the first part of my talk is very a uh, basic targeted to the uh, students and my apologies to the experts for that and second part is the technical one so we all know about the um, uh, measurement so metrology is basically a science of measurement so we are familiar with doing measurements at various level starting from macroscopic macroscopic level to the 
uh, atomic subatomic level so the basic um, uh, problem uh, in of uh, measurement actually involves to associate some physical real value to a, a measurement results but the, our measurements actually uh, adheres some statistical errors uh, which may be of two kinds uh, one is the experimental error and other uh, other are the fundamental uh, limitations imposed by the physical laws of the nature so quantum metrology is basically a, a way of estimating unknown parameters up to the ultimate limits imposed by quantum mechanics using the laws of quantum mechanics so the uh, estimation process so estimation process basically involves uh, the interaction between system and probe and uh, uh, in such a way uh, we prepare a, a state by interacting our system with the probe such that the uh, the probe gets the information of the a parameter that we want to estimate uh, that is uh actually that information is embedded in the physical system while interacting the probe probe is uh takes that information from the system so what we quantum mechanically do is we if prepare the probe state rho not uh, such that it is sensitive to various of the unknown parameters let's say lambda and then interaction of probe with the system through unitary evolution uh, u of lambda depending depends on this uh, particular uh, lambda and this uh, state evolved state is then uh, subject to the uh, Uh, measurement basically uh, povms um, positive valued uh, positive valued measurements and then uh, having that generate some results and on the distribution of these results we have some estimator of the uh, unknown well unknown parameter so uh, repeating this process uh, new times the final estimator in general depends on the complete sequence of measurement results uh, with probability distribution p x lambda so which actually a, is a, a question of uh, statistical uh, mechanics that how how to most efficiently estimate the information from a a given data set which is determined by uh, some non deterministic process so this question actually was uh, answered by uh, statistic statisticians well before the emergence of quantum mechanics so what we actually do is we will apply to estimate some uh, parameter we will apply the uh, Uh, rules um, that are uh, well established in statistical mechanics actually in the information theory as adamsman has uh, somehow used these things uh, uh, in his talk as well so the best way uh, uh, to estimate uh, some uh, parameter is to use the fisher information so fisher information is uh, Uh, depending on this uh, uh, derivative of the unknown parameter so it becomes sensitive to the uh, unknown parameter so knowing this uh, fisher information actually we can uh, gauge the information of the system so this fisher information um, uh, on the other side uh, the uh, 
uncertainty of the result can be uh, measured by this uh, statistical variance or uh, standard deviation, which is actually related to the fissure information um, by this bound. So this is uh, actually known as uh, Kramerov bound. So the intuition is the bigger is the fissure information, uh, the higher estimation per cn is expected. So uh, uh, over here, uh, we are basically uh, taking uh, this Uh, we are here uh, taking a fixed probe and uh, a fixed set of measurements. So we get this uh, bound, which is uh, uh, variance is greater than or equal to one over the Fisher information. So if we uh, extend this notion to the quantum mechanics, actually uh, we can uh, maximize this uh, Fisher information over all possible POVMs and this defines the quantum fissure information. So as by definition, quantum fissure information would be greater than the a classical one because it, it maximizes over all the POPMs. So this uh, gives us a, a bound uh, on quantum mechanical uh, level that is of course uh, gives us a better per cn. So, um, so far we have used, uh, um, in previous case, we have used the a single probe. Uh, we have used a fixed probe and uh, fixed measurements. But in quantum mechanical level, we, we, are, uh, we have taken the a maximum of, the, uh, of all possible uh, measurements among the POVMs. Uh, but if, we uh, use a parallel strategy uh, to uh, for, for, for all possible uh, for all possible uh, different POVMs. We uh, take the uh, process that I explained earlier and uh, implement this. Uh, parallel strategy uh, in which we uh, uh, the final estimator is basically it maximizes over all the uh, all the possible uh, uh, probes. We we actually extend our we actually extend our um, uh, estimation scheme to the m number of probes and the uh, total system evolves into the unitary of this uh, separable in a separable way. So if uh, we have we are having uh, m separable probes, uh, sorry. Uh, we cannot hear you, Dr. Uh, Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah you, now we can hear you. So, so, uh, so for, uh, uh, here we can, uh, we can check what ultimate precision we can have in our uh, estimation process. So oh, for this, we can use, um, um, uh, parallel strat strategy in which we can uh, we can have uh, m is my screen uh, moving uh, yeah uh, your mouse here. yeah we can see your stuck oh yeah we use this parallel strategy in which we uh, use m uh, m um, uh, probes each giving uh, us uh, um, uh, POVM result independent to the others. 
So this scenario can be a, a, a taken as a uh, M independent uncorrelated systems for which the density matrix can be written in this way. So for classically uncorrelated states, the Fisher information um, uh, can be uh, calculated uh, by using the axioms of uh, uh, this Fisher information. The Fisher information actually uh, satisfies the additivity and uh, convexity uh, uh, property. So using the additivity pro uh, property of the Fisher information, so the uh, quantum Fisher information for this uh, classically uncorrelated system uh, comes out this way, which is actually the maximum value FQ max is the a maximum uh, information that can be extracted uh, out of this uh, classically uncorrelated system. So this actually gives us a, a bound uh, this way, a one over uh, reciprocal of this uh, maximum uh, Fisher information. So since uh, FQ max is a constant for a given system, so this uh, Persian bound comes out to be one over square root of the a number of probes of the system. So this is actually what we call the standard quantum mechanic limit. This is the ultimate limit that we can achieve uh, by using classically uncorrelated systems. So uh, if we have uh, some, uh, uh, the, the aim or dream is how to beat this uh, limit uh, beyond um, how we can beat this uh, limit that is imposed um, by the somehow laws of nature. Uh, the one way out uh, that we can find over here is uh, if our initial uh, states are entangled, for example, we take the maximally entangled state and we calculate the Fisher information and that Fisher information comes out to be this. These are HS uh, capital and HS minus are the some eigenvalues uh, of the generators of the system involved. So whatsoever, uh, this HS minus HS is a, uh, maximum uh, Fisher information, uh, and this is again a constant. So we can see that the ultimate bound here comes out to be one over M. So this, uh, this bound is uh, a better, uh, gives us a better Persian up to the order of a multiple of M, square root of M. So this limit is uh, actually the ultimate Persian limit that one can achieve. So this is known as the Heisenberg limit. So uh, uh, it is noted here that uh, by using the uh, classical systems or classical initial states or probes, one can only achieve this standard quantum mechanical limit. But uh, if we want to beat this limit, we have to use some uh, non-classical states, uh, especially the entangled states over here that we have used. So Heisenberg limit is the ultimate dream uh, to achieve in any uh, measurement process. So in this is the general overview of uh, the uh, estimation theory and uh, it's used in uh, quantum mechanics to find the uh, a standard quantum mechanics limit and the Heisenberg limit. But uh, this meteorological system is actually implemented by using many physical systems out of which the photonic one is the, the best scenario due to oh, the very special properties of the photons uh, that's it's a high mobility and uh, uh, low de decoherence. So we implement this uh, um, quantum metrology problem to the uh, photonic setups. So in order to implement, we um, uh, take the quantized field, uh, which is actually uh, written by this quant quantum Hamiltonian 
uh, in terms of the annihilation creation operators uh, that satisfy this uh, bosonic algebra. And these are the basic uh, photonic excitation, de excitation expression that, uh, that are involved uh, in the photonic systems. And uh, these are the a quadrature operators that we will use in our next analysis. So uh, in uh, photonic setup, actually uh, various degrees of freedom of the photons can be exploited for the quantum metrology. Uh, for example, it's uh, polarization, uh, spin polarization or orbital, uh, it's polarization, spin angular momentum or uh, orbital angular momentum may be exploited. Uh, but uh, uh, a very efficient, uh, very easy approach is to, to take the uh, path of the uh, photons that, that can be depicted by means of this Maxander interferometer. Uh, Maxander interferometer actually it consists of two um, uh, beam splitters and a phase shifter and uh, uh, taking some input states which is phase sensitive uh, to the uh, uh, which is phase sensitive uh, uh, we can implement this metrological scheme actually the relevant parameter uh, in this scenario is the um, phase of the field so in this uh, regard we consider some phase sensitive uh, initial states the first one very famous the coherent state uh, coherent state is the eigenstate of uh, any halation operator uh, in terms of the photon number state we can expand this coherent state and uh, if we take the the special features of these coherent states are uh, the photon statistics is uh, the uh, photon statistics is Poissonian. If we take the average number of photon and the variance is the same. So if we exploit this, uh, if we use this uh, photonic state as the input of the uh, Maxander interferometer and uh, use the previous formalism of the Persian measurement, we see that the uh, the, uh, the phase uncertainty uh, reaches to the standard quantum mechanics limit that is one over n. Uh, over here, n is the uh, average number of photons coming out of this coherent state. So uh, using this uh, coherent state, we can only achieve the uh, standard quantum mechanics limit, which is the uh, best possible uh, estimation uh, using a classical like state. In fact, it's expected because coherent states are classical like state nonetheless. Uh, so then uh, we take the maximally entangled state, which are the noon states, uh, using the noon state. Noon states are basically the, uh, in this configuration, um, uh, if we take the noon states for the phase estimation, it comes out to the, uh, to be the, uh, Heisenberg limit. So, so here, uh, the as uh, I explained earlier, the the basic feature that is exploited is the entanglement. Uh, but the noon state uh, can be generated again by the a beam splitter, uh, taking one one photon on the uh, input of the beam splitter, uh, that uh, uh, gives us the superposition. Uh, uh, actually photons bunch together at a single port, never, um, uh, 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 we never find the coincident uh, counts. So uh, generation of, um, actually generation of uh, uh, noon states with the high photon number is uh, uh, problematic that limits the utility of the uh, noon states for the phase estimation problem. So then there is, uh, 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 and other idea to extend this problem uh, for the uh, continuous variable state and the same line we can um, uh, construct the entangled coherent states, uh, which are basically the continuous analog of the uh, noon states using uh, the these uh, uh, coherent states, we can um, 
uh, we can actually overcome various problems that were uh, problem like uh, 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 decoherence to the noisy channels uh, in the case of uh, uh, noon states, uh, those uh, can be overcome. But uh, about the other um, possibilities, we may have uh, the uh, squeeze states. Squeeze states are also very good candidate for uh, the photonic quantum metrology. So if we can see here, the phase estimation comes out to be one over uh, n square plus this n, which is actually a of the scale of the Heisenberg limit uh, up to the limit of large uh, average number of photons. Uh, so that actually uh, gives us an alternative. Even we don't have uh, uh, entangled states, we can perform the, uh, we can exploit the other uh, features of the a quant uh, of the states as a quantum resource, actually here, the non-classicality of the system is being used. So it is uh, well established that non-classicality can be used as, a, uh, as an alternative resource for quantum metrology. So um, uh, here in our uh, work, we actually, uh, uh, this is the, a standard non-classicality uh, criteria that if uh, field states exhibit the um, uh, p functions, the Shen p function is uh, positive, the states are uh, considered as uh, uh, classical-like. If it has negative, so they have uh, non-classical. But uh, to calculate the uh, p function is, uh, a difficult task. So the non-classicality can be uh, gauged through uh, different parameters. The easiest one is this, the Mandel's Q parameter, which is actually the ratio of this variance to mean. If Q is less, the, um, the states are uh, sub-Pisonian, and for Q is equal to zero Pisonian, and Q is greater than zero, it's super-Pisonian. So our, it's a, the negativity of Wigner function that can be used or quadrature squeezing. So um, in our work, we actually uh, exploit, we exploit various uh, systems to uh, get this resource of non-classicality for the purpose of uh, quantum metrology. So if we use the, uh, we construct some, um, a generalized photonic states using the SU11 algebra. We call it SU11 coherent states. So there are a large uh, lot of possibilities of generating such states. And uh, we, uh, we also uh, harness this non-classicality by means of uh, uh, addition of photons to the uh, continuous variable uh, coherent state that, that, that actually enhances the, the, that actually mixes the non-classicality of uh, folk states to the uh, uh, coherent states. So using uh, these photon addition subtraction strategies, we uh, uh, harness the uh, non-classicality of the system. So here are a few results of uh, the work that my PhD student has done. So uh, if we have uh, a coherent state, uh, if we have a, a coherent state and we add the, um, the we add photons to it, so the Mandel Q parameter uh, goes on increasing with the number of addition, uh, adding uh, photons. So that this actually tells us the non-classicality of the system is increasing, and actually, uh, this these states can be used as a better resource for the a quantum metrology. So this is the a work of my one PhD student that has just uh, graduated. And uh, in addition to that, we, uh, in this work, we are, uh, we have uh, used the uh, entangled uh, photon added uh, SU11 state, which gave us very, uh, a large variety of uh, um, initial probe states to 
conduct this quantum meteorological tasks. So uh, the conclusion, so uh, overall, I have uh, overviewed the quantum meteorolo uh, meteorological problem with special focus on the photonic implementation and uh, various uh, achievable ultimate Persian limits has been discussed. Uh, it is uh, observed that uh, uh, beating the uh, standard quantum mechanics limit uh, to achieve the Heisenberg limit can only be possible by using uh, quantum resources such as uh, uh, quantum entanglement and uh, non-classicality of photon states. So we expect that these uh, non-classical states provide us a better uh, way to um, achieve the uh, Persian limbs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahid, for an interesting talk. Uh, is the no question in the chat box. Also, have a time for the next speaker. Thank you so much. Um, sure. If you have, if anyone have a question, leave on the chat box so that uh, Dr. Shah answers.